okay, I want to get into digital IDs and maybe CBDCs a little bit towards the end just because the digital ID system is related to cryptocurrencies in the sense that many of the things, as we'll see when I go through this video, that cryptocurrency promoted and made everyone familiar with are underpinning how the digital IDs will operate and function. And this was necessary for a wide variety of reasons, and some of them were just practical, meaning you needed to get a significant portion of the population to work on this type of code, to enhance it, make it work better, and then you kind of can select the best and brightest who are working on things like the blockchain and distributed ledgers to then come work for you and produce what it is that you want to see that technology used for, what you had in your mind as far as what it would be used for from the beginning, right? But everyone else doesn't know that. They just see this new technology come around, this peer-to-peer digital cash system promoted by an anonymous individual in a white paper who we know isn't an actual person now. <laughs> we know that it was the same people who created the internet itself and the Tor network, on and on it goes. But at the time, people don't know that. They think that this is an actual way to operate outside of the monetary system a way to defeat the monetary system even. Some people sell that kind of narrative in theory, but that was never its design. It was never meant to last in that way. It was a segue into the central bank digital currencies and the whole system that's going to come up around digital IDs. Now, before I play this, pay attention to the cadence of the narrator and the music that they put in the background. All videos like this use the same template. It's that calm, reassuring voice that's not quite in the present moment. It evokes ideas of the future, of a different uh, vibration that the future carries, <laughs> and it's always better than our current state, right, as they're selling these things to us. So pay attention to the narrator's cadence and voice and then how that interrelates with the music that's in the background that's always um, designed to try to put you into this relaxed, disarmed state of being where you're kind of just, oh, okay, this is good. Let me just uh, consider what's going on here. So these two things are always interplaying in a video like this. Anyways, here we go. international arrivals expected to grow 50% by 2030. Travelers need seamless ways to cross borders, but also protect national security while protecting their personal data. The known traveler digital identity, or KTDI, is a public-private collaboration that enhances security efforts while enabling a connected journey for today's international traveler. The KTDI is the only global travel initiative of its kind. Travelers can share documentation and information from one verified identity with partners including government authorities, airlines, and hotels. The KTDI allows travelers to play an active role in travel security efforts by sharing their information proactively. Travelers always retain control over what, when, and with whom they share their information. Now, at this point, we're a minute into the video, and there have been a lot of words spoken, but I still don't know exactly what it is they are proposing here. All I've heard is things like, this will be safe, this will protect you, uh, this will protect your data, this is a public-private partnership, all the top minds are in on it, but <laughs> they really haven't explained anything about it, right? Uh, and then it goes into this scene here, which I have to stop and point out uh, real quick. Data element shared by the traveler. Uh, just <laughs> shows this 
person or silhouette of a person walking through the airport and they give you this imagery that is evoking facial recognition technology and it's uh, sort of priming you for this idea of well yes when all of this technology is integrated uh, the 5G networks the internet of things the smart devices well as they're referred to smart anyway when all of these things are finally functioning as we envision them this will kind of be what your life is like you're walking through the airport and whether the devices are on you or inside of your body it will be interacting with all this technology in real time uh, to the point where your very existence will be analyzed in real time and interacting with everything around you and that's kind of what this little scene is priming you for <laughs> and they just throw this in here uh, briefly but I wanted to highlight that before going on all right is verified accurate and consistent every time this is made possible by the technologies of distributed ledger. Ah, now, uh, as they're showing us this facial recognition technology here, they throw in uh, that this digital identification system is made possible through distributed ledgers. And as I alluded to in the beginning, the blockchain, as it is commonly known, is just a form of distributed ledger. Uh, distributed ledger is another word for blockchain, even though technically they are not the same thing exactly. Uh, I'm not an expert on this technology. I feel like I have a pretty good understanding of it, more so than a, more so than most anyway. But still, I'm not a coder, so I don't understand it on the level that a coder would. Um, so if there are any of you guys listening, please just cut me some slack here. I'm doing the best I can. Uh, but I do feel like I understand the difference between a blockchain and a distributed ledger. But the point is, here they are telling you that this technology is being made possible by what the blockchain introduced to everyone. In other words, Bitcoin made people familiar with the technology, and because it's open source, sort of, I mean, anyone can see the code, but there is this power structure within Bitcoin that kind of dictates what will be adopted and what won't be adopted. And that's why there's all the forks uh, that have, you know, kind of gone off from the main Bitcoin blockchain over the years. But the main difference between the distributed ledgers and the Bitcoin blockchain, for example, is that they don't require the proof of work aspect of it and that makes it much faster and it makes the transactions much easier but they're giving you a clue here here we are in the summer of 2019 and they're telling you oh yes by the way uh this id system is running on a distributed ledger and who do you think built this distributed ledger for uh this pilot program well it was someone who was involved at the ground floor with bitcoin and that's really what I'm getting at here. You see, you put something like that out there to kind of get the hive mind or a minority of the hive mind participating in it, and they advance it, they innovate, and then the power structure takes those innovations and eventually uses it for itself and uses it to achieve what they originally envisioned by putting it out there when they did uh, the white paper in 2008 and then eventually launching it in 2009 right as that financial crisis that they created came to fruition and then they add on top of it the libertarian narrative that this is going to defeat that system that just caused this uh, terrible financial crisis that we're all experiencing and that's how it gets off the ground floor and that's how it's promoted and then they artificially raise the price they get all of their algos in there trading it they create all of the financial instruments in Bitcoin that they already have in the larger financial system they blow the price up to wildly artificial levels and that further gets the mainstream interested and involved in it because they want to chase uh, that money that everyone is apparently making. But hopefully that makes sense, how they bring something out there that then they will eventually take from and pluck all of the people that are working on it 
and use them as a part of the apparatus that they want to create. And that's specifically what I meant by maybe getting into the CBDCs. Because if you look at uh, Project Hamilton and you see who is involved, well, the actual technical side of it is being handled by uh, a few coders that were directly involved in huge names within the early Bitcoin scene. And the fact that they named it Project Hamilton, I mean, I'm just going to hope that all of you guys are aware of the history here and who Alexander Hamilton really was. Uh, but if not, I'll give you a little crash course. Alexander Hamilton was an agent of the bankers in the early revolutionary era of America. And he was spearheading the effort to get a national bank into existence after the Constitution was ratified. And he spent many years uh, attempting to do this. Eventually they achieved it. And then he continued uh, along uh, before he died. This was his primary focus. So the fact that they named uh, the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston in conjunction with MIT and the Brookings Institution, <laughs> uh, there you go, right? Um, the fact that they named it Project Hamilton tells you everything that you need to know about what they have planned for this central bank digital currency. If we look in history at the first na national bank, the second national bank, and then the Federal Reserve and what those entities did to the economy and just the structure of the country in general, well, there's your clue, right? They don't need to tell you much more than that. But maybe we'll get into this a little further uh, into this video. Cryptography and biometrics. As more data and information is added, travelers build more enriched profiles that build trust with each partner interaction. Let's follow one example of what the journey could look like for future travelers. After travelers download the KTDI app and create their profile, governments provide and authenticate the traveler's identity data based on their passport or government-issued digital ID. Biometrics will link the digital identity with the physical person and their national identity document. When approved, profiles are securely stored and encrypted in individual identity wallets. Aha! Now, here's the next part of it. Not only are they using the distributed ledger as the underlying basis for this technology, but now they're telling you, oh, by the way, your profile will be a digital wallet. And you sit there and you say, oh, okay, now I see how the promotion of all these currencies uh, that are referred to as cryptocurrencies, well, I mean, they're not really currencies, right? But the promotion of those, what did everyone learn to use when they bought wh whichever one it was? Well, they learned to use their online digital wallets, uh, you know, assuming they didn't buy a ledger or create a paper wallet, whatever. Uh, an exchange, for example, uh, like Coinbase. Well, everyone is familiarizing themselves with using wallets to transfer coins from here to there, uh, transferring coins from MetaMask to uh, this wallet or that wallet, uh, getting used to the idea, transferring it from this exchange to that exchange. Uh, you're getting used to the idea of having a digital wallet. And like I said, you get the mainstream population involved by increasing the price to obscene levels and then more and more people are becoming familiar with the idea of having a online digital wallet and now what are they telling you in 2019 oh well our digital id is going to use this idea of an encrypted digital wallet this will store all your personal information and they'll use all the buzzwords like it'll keep you safe of course or keep your data safe uh, keep your privacy safe but the point is, they have conditioned people for 13 years now, slowly over time, to get used to the idea of a digital wallet. And, you know, before they were going into the biometric aspect of that, I've gone into that, you know, the fingerprint on the phones, opening the technology with your fingerprint, getting you used to that idea. Uh, all of it is coalescing together with this digital ID that they are now really promoting or really getting it into the collective mind. Hey, this is coming. government attestation 
and additional attestations as proof of the traveller's history with border crossings, plane trips and hotel check-ins. When a traveller shares required identity information... And keep in mind, this is just a pilot program uh, being used with airlines and international travellers. Use your imagination to see what this screen could contain in the future if it was linked to your entire life. And that's where the social credit aspect of the digital ID comes in. Notion. The attributes they share are checked and validated through encrypted links to their source information. Whether the traveler is booking a flight, boarding a plane, or entering a destination country, the travel provider or government authority can be sure that the information shared is authentic and verified by the issuing organization. Travelers could also send their information to authorities in advance of departure, allowing travelers that are deemed low risk to be screened sooner and processed faster. Oh, now did you catch that? Allowing customers who are low risk uh, to be screened and processed faster. Now, to the average person, that seems like a good thing. Oh, I won't have to wait in line with everyone else. I'll have all of my documents taken care of and I'll just go to the airport. It'll be a nicer experience. Uh, but no, we have to stop and say, now, hold on a second. Uh, I need to fast forward 20 years into the future and think for a second, uh, who is defining uh, the low risk passenger versus the high risk passenger? And just even outside of the context of traveling, who is defining a low risk citizen versus a high risk citizen? I hope you see the big problem here, right? Uh, who is making that determination and what is the criteria? For example, would even asking that question make me a high risk citizen <laughs> in the future? Uh, I hope you see. Hotels could offer self-service check-in via facial recognition to ensure travelers are who they say they are. Throughout the journey, the known traveler digital identity creates one connected process to build trust, encourage travel, and allow precious security resources to focus on the areas of greatest need. Components of the known traveler digital identity will be championed by the governments of Canada and the Netherlands. Additional partners include Air Canada, KLM Royal Dutch Airlines, Toronto Pearson International Airport, Montreal Trudeau International Airport, <laughs> in collaboration uh, with the World Economic Forum and Accenture. The known traveler digital identity will be piloted this year, unlocking the power to change how we travel. Now remember, this was made in early 2019, and as they said at the end, scheduled to be implemented in early 2020. Um, how do I say this? What a coincidence that this program with airlines was scheduled to be implemented early 2020, if you catch my drift. <laughs> uh, because then I'll just read these headlines with no further comment. Vaccine passports will help you travel abroad this year, but they won't be without their challenges. Digital health passports promise to simplify travel, but come with lack of standards. Travel is the key here. This digital passport that stores your health information could be required to board flights next year. To fly again, show your digital health passport. Vaccine passport coming soon to Massachusetts, other states. Like I said, uh, sign of the times without further comment, but just an interesting coincidence, right? That this pilot program focusing on international travel, just using a few players in Canada and the Netherlands, uh, was promoted in, er in middle of 2019 and then scheduled to begin in early 2020, given what happened the next two years after early 2020. So then this is an article from the Financial Times, why CBDCs will likely be ID based. So, and this is just, uh, let's see, this is from May of 2021. Before uh, 
the Hamilton project was even released publicly anyway. Uh, they're telling you that these CBDCs will be ID based. And we know from things like Common Pass, which is kind of the next phase in known traveler digital identity. They're both promoted by the World Economic Forum. They're both uh, partnered with the World Economic Forum. We know that this common pass, these digital IDs are using distributed ledger technology and they're using the online digital wallet formats. Uh, so we know that also the CBDCs are going to be using the same ID technology. Meaning you can see the future here in the sense that eventually what they would like to see is your entire financial world being focused in this ID that is completely online, the cashless society as it were. And as they said uh, regarding the low risk versus high risk passenger, well, if it becomes low risk versus high risk citizen, now your very existence is threatened if they decide that you are high risk and they cut off your access to uh, financial means, to the ability to buy food, <laughs> etc. right? You can imagine some very dystopian outcomes here. But uh, I do plan on doing a little bit more into uh, the Hamilton Project in the future, but if I never get around to it, you should look into this on your own because it's it's some wild stuff. But uh, that's it. Later.